Welcome to session number 21 of Biblical Backgrounds. I'm Dr. John McMath, and I'm joined by my friends in Italy and the Philippines and in other places around the world. Uh, and a, a, very, a variety. We've got an eclectic group of friends. Uh, and uh, today we'll be looking at uh, more backgrounds of the New Testament, particularly the Gospels. Uh, we'll be uh, starting out at uh, Qumran and uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, and uh, I'll look at how that forms part of the background uh, for Life of Christ and John the Baptist and uh, uh, some of the other things that are going on. So let me uh, share the screen and make sure I've got the correct one up. Whoops. Okay, it's trying. Oh, we've got a slow internet today, but there it is, finally up. And gallery over there. Okay, Qumran is the uh, uh, the name given to uh, a uh, a settlement and a collection of caves. I've forgotten how many caves there are, like 11 or 12 uh, that have actually been explored and where things have been found. Uh, but the, uh, the community and the caves are about a kilometer and a half from the Dead Sea. They overlook the Dead Sea on the western side near the north end of uh, the Dead Sea. Uh, this is a place that has been known for a good long time, the ruins out on the promontory, you can see some of the ruins in the photo on the right, uh, have been known for a long, long time. Uh, but uh, this has only been uh, actively explored, excavated for about the best 70 years. Uh, the, uh, the thing that really gave a, a boost to uh, the study of the Qumran area it was back in 1947 when an Arab shepherd uh, was chasing a sheep and uh, he wanted to see if that sheep had gone into a cave. And instead of climbing up to the cave, which was quite difficult to get to, and by the way, that's the cave that my students are standing in, he threw a rock from a distance and heard a clay jar shatter. So he went up to take a look and inside the clay jar, he found the fragments of uh, an ancient scroll. It was obviously quite old. Uh, so he went back into uh, his village, told his uh, father about this and a small group of Arabs came back out to the cave and uh, picked up everything they could carry on a couple of donkeys and uh, uh, began selling those scrolls to the antiquity dealers in uh, Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Hebron. Uh, tourists would go into these shops and buy antiques, old pottery and what, whatever. Uh, and uh, the word got around uh, in the antiquities community uh, that there were some old scrolls that were coming up for sale. Uh, and it's about this time a, a famous Jewish um, and by that time Israeli archaeologist who was also, I believe at the time he was a colonel in the Israeli, he was in Shin Beit at the time because uh, it, independence hadn't been declared yet, uh, but fairly important guy, uh, uh, Dr. Mazar had been Maisler in Germany, but he changed his name to Mazar. Uh, uh, got together with another military type archeologist named Yagel Yadin, uh, and they began trying to track down these scrolls. Uh, and they found, the first thing they found in Bethlehem uh, was a two and a half thousand year old uh, copy of the book of Isaiah, which had been found by the shepherd that day in 
this cave near Qumran, and he tracked it down, and the uh, the newly forming Israeli government uh, quickly raised the uh, unconscionable amount of money, a huge amount of money, uh, to buy the scroll. And that was the first scroll that was found. We call it 1Q Isaiah A, and it's a complete copy of the entire book of Isaiah. Uh, probably copied around three to 400 BC. Uh, and uh, that, that was a trigger. Uh, since that time, uh, scholars excavating in the area uh, have found uh, all of the books of the uh, Old Testament, uh, except I believe the Song of Solomon, which is a little short book, one of the poetic books. Uh, and they found a, a large number of uh, what are called sectarian documents, a temple scroll, a scroll of discipline. Uh, in, in other words, uh, materials written by uh, some kind of a religious group. They're obviously Jewish. They were obviously very conservative, uh, but they were strange in a number of ways. Additional exploration led them to uh, a, uh, a community. Uh, the ruin out on the promontory had long been known, but as they began to explore this, they found uh, dormitory type uh, uh, sleeping areas, uh, large dining rooms, uh, and Lots and lots and lots, something like 28 very large uh, tubs, pools for bathing. Now, in, in Hebrew, this is called a mikvah. A mikvah is a, is a, uh, a pool for ritual cleansing. Uh, it usually has, well, it has to have running water. The water has to run in and then run out so that it is living water rather than water that just sits in the, in the uh, pool. Uh, and uh, uh, there are two stairways, one going down and one coming up. And you go always go down the same stairway and you come up uh, ritually cleansed on the other side. Uh, and what's unusual, of course, is this, this is Qumran, it's way out in the desert. Uh, so in order to get all this water, there, uh, there were aqueducts uh, running from uh, way up in the Judean hills. Uh, there were large pools, and uh, it was it's quite the amazing uh, structure. It's obviously a religious community of some type. The first excavators uh, were uh, Franciscans, Franciscan priests uh, who... Uh, came to the place and uh, they're well-meaning people and uh, uh, they did a really good job of excavation, but they saw this place and they immediately assumed it was a monastery. Now, as far as we know, uh, the Jews of Old Testament times had nothing remotely like a monastery. Now, this was something like a monastery. We think it was maybe more of a retreat center uh, there was a permanent community there, but there were also uh, uh, there were guests who stayed for a brief time. Uh, it may have been a retreat center for people coming out from Jerusalem. Uh, there are burials at the site, both uh, male and female and children uh, who died at the, at the site and were buried there. Uh, so this is not a monastery in the in the medieval sense of the term, uh, but it is a religious community of some sort. Uh, one of the uh, interesting questions that comes up, and I think it's important, is whether John the Baptist had a connection with the community at Qumran. We typically call the, uh, the leaders of the community at Qumran Essenes, E-S-S-E-N-E-S. -E -E uh, the Essenes are known from other documents. Uh, so, so we know there was a religious group uh, that could be distinguished from others called Essenes. Now, some of the things that uh, the 
Essene community here uh, was into uh, or that they emphasized also seemed to be emphasized by John the Baptist. Uh, for example, uh, the use of uh, Isaiah 40 and verse 3, uh, the voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord. Okay, which, uh, which Isaiah is uh, uh, using to indicate the forerunner of the Messiah uh, that many have assumed would, uh, would be an Elijah character uh, from the book of Malachi. Uh, Isaiah 40 uh, is uh, found emphasized in quite a number of documents uh, found at Qumran, outside of the biblical documents, uh, the uh, 1Q8, uh, the, one of the scrolls discovered that first afternoon was 1Q8. It's a scroll of discipline. Uh, the Cairo document uh, mentions uh, Isaiah 40, verse 3, the idea of being out into the wilderness, and Qumran definitely qualifies as wilderness, uh, where they will proclaim uh, the coming of the Lord and make a roadway through the wilderness for the Lord. Uh, when John arrived, uh, he uses that same verse. Uh, to announce himself. I'm the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Uh, prepare, the, uh, prepare a road for the Lord. Make the high places low and so on. Uh, so uh, John seems to be in the same, on the same wavelength as uh, the Qumran people. Uh, we know that John lived and worked in the same general area. He was uh, in the southern part of the Jordan Valley, just north of the Dead Sea. So this is the same general area. Uh, John is called the Baptist, literally the dipper. Now, baptism is not a sprinkling. Uh, in every place that we see the word uh, in the Bible, it, it, it refers to the common use of the word, which is a dipping or a dunking. Uh, like if you were to put clothing in the water to wash it, uh, that would be a baptism. If you were to immerse yourself, get completely into a big pool of water for cleansing, like taking a bath, the idea is to get all the way into the water. Uh, a, a little sprinkle or uh, a little dipping of uh, a finger in water and rubbing doesn't doesn't have the same meaning at all. Now, uh, baptism in this sense of an immersion in water uh, is uh, uh, something that John used uh, as a way of marking those who accepted his teaching. So John would preach and he would teach, and the people who wanted to identify with the righteous remnant of Israel came out to listen, and they uh, asked for baptism, uh, and uh, John was willing to do that. This practice is completely unknown in the Old Testament. We don't see any of it at all, uh, uh, but it was quite common at uh, Qumran, as I say, 20 odd uh, pools at Qumran, you could see the round and sometimes oval and sometimes square shaped pools at, uh, at Qumran. Uh, so another connection with John. Uh, we know that John's parents were old when he was born. Uh, so Elizabeth uh, gave birth in a miraculous way. We're not told exactly how the miracle happened. It doesn't really matter, but the Luke 1 uh, tells us that uh, both uh, uh, Elizabeth and, uh, and her husband were well past the age where they would normally have children, but here comes John. Uh, most likely, uh, uh, John's parents died when he was uh, a child. The Qumran community took in orphans. It is entirely possible uh, that John was an orphan uh, taken in by the Qumran community. Uh, John's diet, we're told in Matthew 3, 4, consisted of uh, 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 wild honey and locusts. 
Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure I could get by on that, uh, but this same thing is paralleled in uh, a, um, a document called the Damascus document, uh, fragments of which were found in uh, three of the Qumran caves. Um, so we think it's, uh, it's very likely uh, John was a part of this community, and uh, I think probably the Qumran people uh, were uh, messianic in the sense that they were expecting uh, the coming of Messiah. Uh, we're, we're not at all sure that anyone at Qumran besides John uh, actually became Christian. Uh, there's just no records of that at all. But Qumran is a fascinating place. And there's a lot going on here. Now let's head north. We'll look at uh, Kephraneum in the north part of Israel on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee is this little town of uh, Capernaum. Uh, it's sometimes called something like Capernaum. <laughs> uh, Kephar village at Naum is the, the prophet Naum. So the village of the prophet Naum, uh, north central shore of the Sea of Galilee, uh, you know, right on the road that would go around uh, it's a, a center for fishing. Uh, Jesus chose to live in this region of, uh, of uh, uh, Capernaum, probably at the house of uh, Peter. Uh, there's a limestone synagogue in the city uh, that is uh, very well known. This is one of the landmarks of northern Israel. Uh, and it's uh, made of white limestone, very, very nicely made. Uh, tradition has it that it was put up by a Roman centurion, uh, uh, probably in the second century. Uh, there's an earlier synagogue that's visible. The footings of an earlier synagogue are visible underneath the limestone synagogue. Uh, and that's probably the uh, synagogue that dates back to the time of Christ. Nearby is a structure here on the, uh, on the right uh, that should be identified with the house of Peter itself. Uh, it's uh, not exactly certain, but it's very likely. Uh, the, uh, the ruins of the, the residence are overlaid with a Byzantine octagonal chapel. It's probably a chapel of the sort routinely built over holy places during that era. Uh, so the, the 300s and 400s AD uh, Christians who lived in the area considered this a holy place. Archaeology has demonstrated that the original house was being used as a house church in the years before 300 AD. Uh, does this automatically make it the right place? Well, no. Uh, it's real close to where Peter's uh, mother-in-law had to have lived. Uh, we're told in the Gospels that uh, her house was very close to the synagogue. And this is a house that is very close to the synagogue. It's exactly in the right place. Uh, and it was treated by the early church as a holy place. So. Uh, there, there's a good chance. Um, in uh, 1990, uh, the, site had, <laughs> the site was overshadowed by the construction of a great, big, futuristic Catholic church. Uh, and it, it's quite a remarkable building. Uh, the, uh, uh, the church is cantilevered out over the top of the archaeology site so that it is actually still possible for archaeologists to get in underneath. Uh, there's a, a large window built into the floor under the altar of this uh, church. Uh, and uh, during times when there's not a service going on, you can actually get in and go up to the rail and look down into the church. So it's not as bad as some. Uh, still, I wish they had just built a large shelter so that 
people could go in out of the rain and and look at the original house, but it is it's no longer possible. The uh, roof of this house was probably made like uh, all of the houses of this era uh, with wooden branches uh, covered with mud and clay. Okay, this is called a, a wattle and daub roof. Uh, those things were built up and they, they could be fairly thick. It was a lot of, lot of mud and branches and it was a fairly sturdy roof. They were kept flat uh, by using a roller. Uh, and uh, that was very common. Uh, uh, when we uh, see the gospel uh, story uh, in uh, uh, Mark 2 uh, about uh, people climbing up on the roof and cutting a hole, to let down the lame man, this is the kind of roof they're cutting through. Uh, so you know, those of us who think they, they must have taken a chainsaw up there or some other kind of construction tools, no. <laughs> you, could, you could do it uh, actually with your bare hands, but uh, it would, if you had a hammer or something, it'd be fairly easy to knock a hole in the roof. Uh, sometime during this first century, the house was plastered. That is, it was covered up with uh, plaster inside and out. Uh, and uh, that was unusual. The other uh, residences in Capernaum were just stone. Uh, the uh, pottery repertoire that we find in this house uh, changes from normal residential pottery uh, to uh, simple storage jars and oil lamps. Uh, so. Yeah, there are inscriptions on the walls in uh, oh, five different languages <laughs> that attest to the ancient popularity of the place. Uh, the eastern part of the ancient city of Capernaum is controlled today by the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, and it's been excavated since the mid 80s, uh, revealing a very large Roman city complete with a bathhouse, all kinds of broader, uh, Gentile presence. Uh, we often speak of uh, the area around the Sea of Galilee as Galilee of the Gentiles. Uh, and something that uh, is important for us to understand about the background is that Jesus was doing his ministry, not in a Jewish bubble, uh, but in the larger Gentile world. Uh, the Jewish community at uh, Capernaum uh, lived comfortably beside a much larger Greco-Roman community. Uh, and Jesus came to that whole community. All right, let's go on here. Uh, this is also the north end of the Sea of Galilee. This is the upper right corner of the Sea of Galilee, Gergesa. Uh, the uh, uh, more modern name for the place is Kersey. Uh, and uh, this is the, uh, the location of the miracle of the deviled ham. And uh, Luke 8, uh, we're told that uh, Jesus came to this, this place on the uh, eastern side of the Sea of Galilee and up on the plateau. Uh, he, he found a, uh, a demon-possessed man whose name was Legion, and he cast out the demons. Uh, who begged him not to cast them into the pit. And he said, well, where, where else should I cast you? Uh, and uh, the demon said, well, how about those pigs over there? So there was a large herd of pigs. Uh, and uh, Jesus cast the demons into the pigs who promptly ran over a cliff and drowned in the Sea of Galilee uh, at great cost to their owners. And that got Jesus and his disciples into some trouble. That's a fascinating story and it's a, a good story to tell. There, I've, I've done short shrift for that story, but we call that the miracle of the deviled ham. Uh, Kersey is about 14 kilometers south and east of Capernaum. So not very far away. It's with an easy walking distance of Capernaum. Uh, and it's the site of a Byzantine church complex at the foot of a steep cliff. Uh, this is very likely the Gergesa of uh, New Testament times. 
The church stands about 300 yards from an unexcavated tell that was an ancient city. The shoreline nearby has the ruins of a well-developed port. Uh, as I recall, there are about 24 or 28 uh, ruined ports uh, on the uh, Sea of Galilee. Uh, so the Sea of Galilee was heavily populated uh, at the time of Christ. And it was primarily Gentiles who lived in this area. Uh, and the, uh, the fishing in the Sea of Galilee has always been and continues to be very good. The water is warm. Uh, there's lots of nutrients in the water. It's ever so slightly salty. And the fish just love it. Uh, there's a, uh, a variety of perch that we typically call St. Peter's fish. And, uh, it's really, really good. Uh, the the, uh, uh, the nice restaurants in Tiberias uh, will sell you a, a, a dinner a special of St. Peter's fish with uh, a couple of side dishes uh, for a reasonable amount, and uh, everybody likes that. Uh, it is is very very good uh, very good fish. Probably similar kinds of fish lived in the sea at that time. Uh, Kersey was one of those um, one of those uh, fishing villages. Uh, the church was dedicated. This church that you see on the left, with its arch uh, over the apse, dedicated about 585 A.D. Uh, there uh, uh, seems to be uh, an older chapel underneath, but the 585 AD is when this large monumental structure was built. It's really rather lavish as uh, church buildings go. Uh, it would have had a half dome and it would have had uh, limestone pillars that you can see with the, uh, the basalt blocks uh, building it up. Uh, it had a complete uh, uh, baptistry off to the right-hand side. It apparently uh, a, uh, a memorial to some really important biblical event. Uh, so for a variety of reasons, this place probably marks the spot. The hill that you can see in the background can be partially climbed. Uh, you can see some limestone steps that are not limestone, but basalt steps uh, that have been laid into the hillside. You can climb up that cliff to about halfway. Uh, and that's the cliff that the uh, 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 pigs would have jumped off. It's probably the right place. Uh, this is uh, this is the this marks the spot. Here's the synagogue at Chorazin. Uh, uh, the uh, Gospels record that Jesus cursed three cities for their lack of faith. And all three of these were on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, these are Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin. Uh, and Chorazin can be spelled with a C-H or with a K, uh, same as uh, uh, Capernaum. Uh, same sound, you can just do it two ways in, in Hebrew. Uh, Chorazin is probably the site two and a half miles northwest of Capernaum on the, uh, on the road that goes past the Mount of Beatitudes. We can drive up to Chorazin, it's just a little further. Uh, and uh, Chorazin is surrounded by uh, relatively barren territory, lots and lots of uh, volcanic rock and basalt. Uh, so that's what they build from, of course. Uh, the uh, town that we see uh, has been partially reconstructed by Israeli archaeologists, uh, but they've done a nice job. Uh, they haven't added any new stuff. So I, I like the reconstruction here. Uh, the uh, parts that we can see today uh, can't be dated certainly before about the third century, before the 200s AD, uh, but the overall plan and structure of the town must have been very similar to the uh, town in Jesus' day. Uh, there wouldn't have been that much that changed, in other words. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the synagogue is similar in structure to the synagogue at Capernaum, but it, it's made of basalt instead of limestone uh, because basalt was easily available. It's quite ornate though. Uh, uh, columns topped with capitals. It's, it's really quite the place. Uh, in all of these places, we see a Jewish community uh, that is uh, prosperous and comfortable. Uh, this is a place where Jews and Gentiles lived in close proximity, uh, and yet everyone got along. That's interesting. Uh, on the uh, right in this slide is a little bit of the paved area we call the, uh, the square or the piazza. Uh, those of you in, uh, in Italy know all about the, the uh, piazza in the middle of town. Uh, and that's a cultural center of an ancient town uh, during the Greco-Roman period. Uh, prior to that, in the Old Testament period proper, the public area would have been just inside the gate. Uh, but Chorazin didn't have a wall. None of these cities had walls anymore. The Roman armies provided their walls. Uh, and there would be along the central business district, there would be a large open area for public meetings, for uh, impromptu markets, uh, for people to sell their stuff. Just a piazza, public area. Uh, get a cup of coffee and sit and watch the Lamborghinis drive by. Good place. Caesarea Philippi is uh, mentioned several times in the Gospels. This is a place where Jesus went with his disciples. Uh, and there are really two parts to Caesarea Philippi. Is way up in the north is one of the sources of the Jordan River. There are quite a number of individual sources for the Jordan. Uh, they all relate to Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is the 10,000 foot shield shaped limestone mountain at the north end of uh, Israel on the west side of Syria and on the east side of Lebanon. Uh, and it provides water for all of those places or the major rivers that uh, provide water for Lebanon, Syria, uh, uh, Israel, and Jordan all come from Mount Hermon. Uh, the snow goes, uh, goes on Mount Hermon during the winter and that snow gradually melts uh, long into the summer. Uh, Mount Hermon tends to be snow capped all the way through the uh, summer months. Uh, and that snow melts down into the sponge of uh, the mountain itself. And it gradually trickles out in fairly large amounts uh, through springs. Uh, and those are the sources of these rivers. So this is the headwaters of the Jordan River. Uh, the um, uh, most famous part of uh, uh, Caesarea Philippi uh, is the, uh, 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 the sacred uh, space. Here on the left, you see uh, tourists walking on paths next to a lot of pools. Uh, and there were there were springs and pools and streams running all over the place, and you could hear them bubbling. Uh, the ancient people thought that this was probably uh, the god Pan blowing on his uh, pipes. Uh, so the the place in ancient times was called Banias or the uh, the Pan Creek. Uh, they they thought they could hear his pipes and. <laughs> whatever. Uh, there are caves and niches. Uh, apparently, there was a white marble uh, temple built here uh, uh, to Augustus Caesar that was present in New Testament times. Uh, we see a corner of the footings of that in one of the spots up here. Uh, the uh, 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 the water trickles everywhere. It's a 
it, it's a cool place to visit in the summer uh, in Israel. Nearby, there's a canyon with uh, springs gushing up. Uh, these students of mine on the right are uh, walking along that canyon. This is a place much less visited. Uh, and most scholars believe that this is the place down here in the canyon next to the, uh, next to the stream, uh, to the waterfalls, where uh, Jesus would have gone with his guys to get away from it all. Why go to a crowded place where there are uh, pagan temples and lots of tourists when you can go to a quiet place next to the water? And I believe that that's the spot uh, rather than the built up sacred precinct. So this is another place. Uh, Nimrod's Castle is the name of it. And it looks like a Crusader era castle. Is actually built by the uh, Arabs to keep the Crusaders from getting along on the road here in the uh, Galilee. And it changed hands several times during the Crusades. But this is uh, this is built on a promontory of Mount Hermon, easily visible from Caesarea Philippi. So if you're at the if you're in a, a high place or an open spot at Caesarea Philippi and you look up toward Mount Hermon, it's right there. It's obvious that Mount Hermon is there. And one long spur of the mountain uh, contains this big castle. It's built probably in the eighth uh, or ninth century, maybe the 10th century, it's hard to know. Uh, but the high place uh, was always there. Uh, this is very likely the location for the transfiguration of Christ, as opposed to Mount Tabor, which is about 100 kilometers to the south. Uh, the uh, uh, Gospel of Mark uh, says, uh, and immediately from Capernaum, after Peter's confession of Christ, and immediately Jesus took uh, his disciples, two of his disciples, up onto a high place that was nearby where he was transfigured before their eyes. Uh, that would be this spot, not obviously uh, Mount Tabor. It's much too far out of the way. Okay, uh, let me show you another spot. This one uh, goes all the way back to the, uh, uh, the time of uh, uh, Jesus' youth. Uh, this is Sepphoris. Uh, of course, it's not mentioned in the Bible, uh, but uh, this is the market center uh, for Nazareth and several dozen other small villages round about. Uh, in uh, uh, Matthew 13, when Jesus goes to Nazareth and is rejected there, 1355, uh, says, is this not the carpenter's son? Uh, uh, Jesus was considered also a carpenter. The Greek word is technon. We get our word technician from that, or technical. Uh, uh, Sephorus is a good place to look for some of the examples of technical work. Uh, uh, da, da, down, down. Uh, Sepphoris is in the uh, Betna Tofa Valley, uh, not too far from uh, Nazareth, within walking distance of Nazareth, which was up on the ridge. Uh, Sepphoris is uh, right down in the valley itself on the side of the hill. Uh, and it's very likely uh, that uh, uh, Jesus and his dad, Joseph, uh, spent time in Sepphoris on business they might have had a, a carpentry shop, a, uh, a technical shop on the main drag in the uh, business district of uh, Sepphoris. Uh, Herod Antipas uh, made Sepphoris a focal point of his building program. So there's a lot of monumental construction going on here. Uh, there was a regular Jewish community uh, in Sepphoris. This is a shot of the, the Jewish quarter of the uh, town of Sepphoris. Most of Sepphoris was a Greco-Roman city. 
people spoke Greek, they were Hellenized, they were, of course, pagans. Uh, here's a Greek theater in uh, Sepphoris. Uh, Jesus may have been involved in building this. Uh, yeah, this is his kind of work. Uh, the pomegranates are just an extra. Uh, and, uh, Jesus may have liked pomegranates, who knows? Okay, this is a Greek villa. Actually, we're looking down onto the roof of the, uh, the villa. Uh, on the right is a mosaic from the interior. Uh, I've, uh, when I take uh, students here, I've always called this the animal house, uh, uh, named after a, uh, a very raunchy movie of um, years and years ago. I've forgotten when that, I've never seen it, uh, but it's about uh, uh, fraternity boys uh, behaving badly. Uh, so I call this the animal house. Uh, why? Well, because the, the central room in this house uh, is decorated with mosaics of the gods learning how to party. Uh, and uh, in this particular mosaic, we get a, uh, a picture of the young god Dionysius, who is the, the god of wine, learning how to drink. And the other gods and goddesses are playing music, and they've got a goat, uh, and they're, uh, they're bringing grapes. Uh, and uh, the, the whole message of the mosaic floor uh, is uh, that even the gods had to learn how to uh, how to drink and party. <laughs> uh, the this central room is surrounded by a whole bunch of smaller little rooms, uh, which were obviously used by the partiers to uh, get close to their friends. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. This is about. 100 meters from the Jewish quarter. Jesus came regularly to this town. This is, this is a part of the background of Jesus' life. Uh, Jesus knew full well that there was serious sin going on in the world. He was, he was not the slightest bit cloistered. Uh, he, he knew what was happening in this town. Here's the business district, the market area of uh, Sephorus, uh, complete with cactus. Uh, uh, people don't realize that cactus actually grows in, uh, in uh, Israel, it certainly does. The uh, market area is uh, spectacular. Uh, on the right is the uh, uh, Cardo. This was the main paved street that came through the business district uh, with uh, uh, porticoed storefronts on both sides. Uh, it's entirely possible that uh, Joseph had a storefront here uh, where he could make contracts to go out and do work. Uh, the mosaic on the left is a part of a very large uh, Gentile market area. Uh, the shops could be set up, just laid out on a rug on the on the tile to set up. But very ornate, very beautiful, very uh, uh, very much a, a piece of monumental architecture. Uh, there's one particular area of the market that we often call uh, the uh, Mona Lisa of the Galilee. Uh, that's this uh, the, the tile mosaic tile uh, picture on the left. This was taken in really dim lighting, uh, so this is the best shot I have of the uh, Mona Lisa of the Galilee. But imagine making a, a picture like that out of small pieces of stone. Uh, the stone is cut for its color and tiny pieces of stone are laid into a, uh, into a cement mastic uh, in order to get the, the shapes and the shades and the colors that are wanted. Uh, it's absolutely amazing art, uh, really and truly. 
uh, whether this is pagan or not doesn't matter to me very much. Uh, the the skill that went into that is astounding. Uh, the other mosaics are not quite as good. It's uniformly pagan. This is a, a, all of the inscriptions are Greek, uh, and uh, the uh, the food and the wine and the partying are all very very. Greek. There's another city not too far away. If we go up the uh, Jezreel Valley, out of the Betnatova Valley, and come over the Nazareth Ridge, come down into the Bet or into the uh, Jezreel Valley, and keep going toward the Jordan River, you'll eventually come to Bet Shan. Bet Shan is the uh, largest and best preserved Roman city in Israel. Uh, it's a very, very large ruin. Uh, sometimes called Scythopolis, uh, which is the uh, uh, Roman name, uh, or Bet Shan, which is the Old Testament name, the Hebrew name. Uh, the history of Bet Shan goes back uh, roughly 6,000 years. It's an old, old place. Uh, the uh, Old Testament site uh, is a, a very tall uh, tell uh, that. Um, was undoubtedly the place where Saul and Jonathan were hung out to uh, be on display after their deaths on uh, uh, Mount Gilboa. But the Roman city goes well beyond all of that. Uh, the, uh, uh, the site has always been known uh, uh, ever uh, for the last 200 years. Travelers who came to this area would uh, remark on the vast field of, uh, of ruins, marble columns sticking up out of the ground and so on. And the local people uh, have known forever that there was a ruined city of some sort uh, underneath the, uh, the ground. Back in 19, the early 1980s, uh, the uh, city of Beth Shan lost its major industry. It was a uh, textile manufacturing firm. They made wool and uh, linen uh, cloth. And most of the families in Beth Shan uh, had their jobs either at the factory or somehow or another associated with the factory. Uh, and for reasons that I don't know, uh, the factory shut down and all of the people in town were out of work. And the city fathers said to one another, what can we do? Uh, the city will simply dry up and blow away. And somebody said, well, what about those that field of ruins out by the tell? Uh, why don't we send people out there to excavate that? And so they began to do that. Uh, and it, uh, people were hired full time uh, to go out and begin excavating. As they, as they dug, they discovered that this is really a very big thing. So young people from Bet Shan were sent off to the university to study archaeology. And they came back and began seriously and scientifically excavating the city of Bet Shan. It is the most well excavated Roman city uh, in Israel. Uh, it has become the full time job of the entire city of Bet, uh, the modern city of Bet Shan, uh, to develop this park. Uh, today, it takes three or four hours. Uh, to work your way through the archaeological site of uh, Bet Shan uh, is similar in many ways to a trip to Pompeii in Italy, a very, very large, uh, large place. Uh, uh, the uh, city of Bet Shan, not mentioned in the New Testament, uh, however, the group of cities that it was a part of is mentioned fairly regularly in the Gospels. Uh, Bet Shan was one of the 10 cities of the Decapolis the 10 cities uh, that were the, the Greek uh, cities of, uh, of the region. Uh, anyway, uh, today, if, uh, if you ever visit Israel, uh, this is one of the places that 
the group will stop. It's almost impossible to skip at Shan. Uh, this is a view on the left of the bathhouse area. You remember Roman cities always had a bathhouse? Well, Bet Shan has a great big bathhouse. And this was expanded during the later Byzantine era up into the 600s. Uh, and when it uh, passed into Muslim hands, the Muslims just expanded on the bathhouse, even while they tore down the, uh, the villas and all of the rest, they kept the bathhouse open. Uh, the, um, uh, da -dum -dum -dum. Uh, probably uh, Bet Shan, like the rest of the Decapolis, seemed to have reached its height of importance around 200 AD. Uh, and that was all downhill from there. Uh, the city, uh, like most of the Greco-Roman cities in this whole region, uh, were knocked down in a major earthquake of 749 AD. Uh, that was the end of, uh, of Bet Shan. Uh, that wasn't rebuilt until modern uh, eras. Okay, on the way from uh, Bet Shan, heading south, we know that Jesus stopped and talked to the woman at the well. This is the uh, famous story in John chapter four, the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well uh, is, uh, is a gem. It's a great little story. Uh, we can spend a huge amount of time <laughs> talking about Jesus at the well. This is the actual well. Uh, you, can, you can see the, uh, 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 the, the stone well and a bucket. That's a modern bucket, by the way, and a modern rope. Uh, and that's not Jacob holding the bucket. That's a, uh, that's a Greek Orthodox uh, uh, priest. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the modern Greek Orthodox Church administers the site, and they've, they've got a, a whole church built up over the top of it. Uh, it's surrounded by Palestinian territory. Uh, and strangely enough, Jacob's Well is rarely vandalized. Uh, just upstairs from Jacob's Well is uh, a place called uh, Joseph's Tomb. And it's probably the real tomb of Jacob or the real tomb of Joseph. Uh, the uh, uh, Palestinians love to go and vandalize uh, Joseph's tomb. Uh, they'll occasionally kill a soldier or whatever they have to do in order to uh, take pickaxes to uh, Joseph's burial place. But Jacob's well has uh, survived very nicely into the modern era. Uh, nearby, we've got Mount Gerizim and the Samaritan temple stood there. The Samaritans were a kind of a mongrel people. They were a mixture of uh, the Old Testament Northern Kingdom Israelites uh, with the Assyrian settlers who were sent into the region. Uh, so it was a, um, it was, let's say it's a difficult place. Uh, and uh, the Samaritans were never popular with the Jews, uh, fairly or unfairly, that's, that's the way it was in those days. Uh, the uh, temple apparently still stood in New Testament times. It's mentioned by Jesus in John 14. Uh, and uh, we can still find foundations of that old Samaritan temple. So all of this thus far uh, gives us an idea of uh, some of the background uh, places Jesus went. Uh, that uh, the New Testament says he was here, he was there, this happened, that happened. Um, even more so than with the Old Testament, uh, I can take my Bible in one hand and a shovel in the other and go look at the places where the Bible actually happened. Uh, and yes, there, there are too much incense and too much gingerbread, but this is the actual spot. Uh, this is Jacob's well. 
uh, wells don't move. <laughs> and there's so much that we can say about so many of these places. The places don't move. Uh, we know that they were there uh, before and uh, during and after the life of Christ. These are the real backgrounds. So that's that's the fun of uh, of dealing with uh, uh, the uh, uh, the backgrounds of uh, New Testament studies. Okay, folks, I'm I'm going to shut down for the day. Uh, just to, to get everything balanced. And on Monday, we're going to uh, finish up and get into the, uh, the crucifixion narrative. We'll go all the way through the, the last bits of the life of Christ as he heads down to Jerusalem. We're gonna walk around Jerusalem and show you a bunch of stuff uh, that uh, forms the background for the New Testament in uh, Jerusalem. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I like Jerusalem. Uh, our uh, our pastor at the little church where we worship uh, uh, has uh, managed to get himself a spot on uh, uh, the uh, school trip. He's uh, he's uh, in school working on a degree in in the ministry, uh, and uh, his school has got a trip laid on for Israel. So he'll be gone for three weeks. Uh, he'll spend most of that time in Jerusalem. And oh, I do envy him. I love Jerusalem. Uh, and I'm so glad that he gets to go. Uh, he'll come back with lots and lots and lots of pictures, just like I did. <laughs> and, and he'll teach people for years to come uh, with uh, uh, all of the good stuff that he's going to pick up. So I hope this has been helpful. Let me, uh, let me see if I can make this happen over here. I want to unmute everybody uh, and say bye-bye. We'll see you Monday. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Dr. John. Take care. Brother Oscar. We'll see you Monday. Stay in touch. We'll see you on Monday. Bye-bye, Teresa. Roger, there you are. I see you there. Uh, there's PJ. <laughs> All right, I'm on. <laughs> and Anton and June. Okay, guys. Love you. Bye bye, Don. Bye bye. Uh, I'm going to see if I can make this. Where is my cursor? Here it is. <laughs>